anthemic. Is that a word? Yeah. <clears throat> Something with with an anthem-like sure. ring to it. It's a little song by a startup band called Bruce Springsteen, the Street Band. Uh, a new album coming out, and uh, so some of us get excited about that kind of thing, thrilled about it. Uh, so, so that's going to be coming. Called The Wrecking Ball, but on Doug Padger Radio today. Uh, we, we don't have the interview yet lined up with uh, Mr. Springsteen oh, to come on the show. It's coming. But, uh, you know. Working we'll, on it. We'll keep trying. Sure. But we do have Richard Rohr coming on today. Know, and and, and we will ask Richard uh, what his favorite Bruce Springsteen song is. Let's it's one of the it. things that uh, we used to do regularly on the show, and now sometimes I forget. So. Do you remember what mine is? You asked me this once. Do you know what mine is? Um, more, no. No. All right. Do you remember? Yep. What is it? Secret Garden. Secret Garden. Mm-hmm. Really? Yes. How about that? My favorite that? one. Wow. It's got some serious clearance at the end. Yes. Well, well very nice. Well, Carla and I, uh, that's Carla Barnhill, uh, the, the voice of uh, the sidekick today. <laughs> we were chatting about this this whole issue that uh, that comes to our, our cultural, um, in, into the cultural purview when yeah. someone famous dies. You start to hear publicly the kinds of things that people have to say to one another privately. And, and I'm convinced that in, in North American culture, and I, I think greatly influenced by, uh, by some, some religious impulses, yes. we have a, a, an inability to talk about death in ways that seem to be fully um, comforting to, to people. Yeah, and in I, an, ironically, in an effort to comfort people. In an effort to comfort, yeah. that, that there becomes a minimization of this life in order, too often there becomes a minimization of this life in order to make the death entrance yes. into the other life be meaningful. Yeah. So there becomes this whole thing about, well, um, you know, uh, God has done this because it's what the person ultimately needed or what God needed or something. And there's just a lot of, um, there's a lot of workarounds in this whole explanation yeah. of death, right? Well, and for somebody like you who tends to see the life, this life and this world as a good Place right. And a good thing. Yes. It can be especially jarring. You know, there, there are people whose narrative is that this is the shadow existence, mm-hmm. that what we have here, you know, the world is broken and desolate and everything here is yes. bad and bad and bad. Yeah. You know, and so anything that happens to help us escape that is good. Right. You and, know, so and I'm compelled by this jesus narrative where Jesus right. says things like, we should pray that the, that the will of God would happen on earth as it does in heaven, that what we're trying to do is to align our life in this world right. with the desires of God, not trying to get out of this life <laughs> into the real place that the we call deal. home. Yeah. And so some of that narrative about, well, you know, uh, God just wanted her to be home, which I was hearing about the Whitney Houston um, uh, tragedy, had me saying, like, do, does one then have to expect that God doesn't see this as our home? And if you just think you're renting, if you just think that you're visiting this world, if you think right. that this is all just passing through, let me tell you, you, you live differently as a temp well, absolutely. Than you do as a permanent absolutely. resident. Because what, what, what impulse do you have to make it better? What impulse do you have to bring about the kingdom of God here mm-hmm. if it's never going to be here, if yeah. this is just broken and bad? Yeah, if, it's, if, if everything's just a, just a cheap workaround in this life and really your home is elsewhere. And, and I'll have to, I mean, I don't want to get into all the deep theology, but there's almost no way in which someone reads the scriptures held by the Christian and Jewish communities uh, and end up, meaning the Bible, and end up with a narrative in which this is the place we're trying to get out of, right. and that other place after death is the real home. Right. It's extremely difficult. I mean, you, yeah. you really you have, have to— You have to get away from all the redemption talk, even in the Old Testament. It's all very earth-grounded. Yeah, you have this to tell— This is what's going to happen. Yeah, you have yeah. to tell a whole other story to make yeah. that to, to make yeah. that dinghy-doggy work. Well, I know that piece of it is really dis- disturbing for you. For me, the God piece of it is what's yeah. disturbing, what that statement says about who God is. And that, for me, comes, you know, from my whole, my own religious background. But just the idea that God is up somehow pulling these puppet strings and that when God decides God wants something, bam, it's going to happen. Whatever happens to you, sorry. You know, God, mm-hmm. that what God wants is more mm-hmm. important than what you want. Well, and before the and break, that, you were saying there was a quote yeah, that, that there was, you found there was meaningful. Yeah, I think it's Rabbi Herschel. And I'll probably get the wrong rabbi. But I think it's him. He, he had a son who died. Just clump them all together, yeah, these rabbis. Right. Say Rabbi Joseph, it's safe. Yeah, it's not Rabbi Joseph. I know that for a fact. Anyway, but his, his, this rabbi, his son died as a college student. He was about 20 years old or whatever. His son dry, um, drove his car off a bridge and drowned. And, um, you know, and so the rabbi talked about how people would say things like this to him, mm-hmm. like, you know, God wanted another angel or God wanted him to come home. And he found that very offensive because he said, you know, that suggests that somehow God wanted my son to drink too much at a party and drive too fast across a bridge and had those engineers build a 
bridge with bad lighting on it. Mm-hmm. And and he said, you know, the thing that comforts me is the idea that when my son hit the water, God's heart was the first one to break. Mm-hmm. So that's what brings me comfort, that mm-hmm. God grieves with me. Mm-hmm. And in the midst of my deepest despair, God is there despairing with me yeah. over how tragic death is. Mm-hmm. And I just, I just think... It, that's a, a whole other way of viewing God. Right. And to view God as sort of this on high deity who's going to just pull your mother or your kids or your sister or whatever away from you because he's got nothing better to do or needs another angel in right, the choir. Right, to fulfill God's... Right, yeah. it just feels like, boy, that's... I'm not sure I can I can get in with that. Yeah. So I have like these philosophical explanations as to why we've ended up with a narrative in which God doesn't grieve and hurt because people want God to be above humanity. Yeah, and above human emotion because above... emotion feels so weak and frail. Right, and see, that's what... I, and I, I'm, I'm not a highly emotive person. And, well, I have a, there's a whole range of emotions that, yes. that I don't, I don't, I don't that access. You don't and, access. Yeah. Okay. And, and don't move. But, but I don't think that that makes someone any more supernatural. Right, right. right. And, and that whole notion, I've talked about that a lot on the show, that this, this notion of being supernatural, that natural is bad. So a deity-like figure is super, more than natural. Right. As opposed to what we as human beings know in this life are all of the lived experiences, the emotions and the pains and the pleasures and the, and the, and the engagements. And there's no way to talk about life or God where God's not a part of that. Right. Cause we don't have language or anything else to attach to that. Right. And, and so why do you think it is Carla? What's, what's your suggestion on why do you think people are, uh, tend to want to tell these narratives where rather than God aching and hurting and crying alongside, mm-hmm. we want God to be Above and beyond all that. Like when people in, yeah. the, in the Jesus narratives, there's a couple of these times where Jesus has a very emotional uh, outburst. He, he weeps at the death of a friend. Mm-hmm. And people, when they tell those stories, will say things like, oh, this really shows the humanity of Jesus as opposed to the divinity of Jesus. I don't know if you've heard this kind of thing, <laughs> yeah. but you hear that a lot, right? Yeah. Like, oh, he, I guess he really was human. Yeah. Because he cried. Like, he even showed his his human weakness and then I guess was going to overcome that at some point. Yeah. But why can't we have, as the as it seems that the, 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 the narratives of the Bible tell us, that God is 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 emotionally engaged in this world that we live in. What well, do you, I do, do think and I think and I think we we want God to be emotionally engaged in what we think of as the positive emotions. Oh, that God you know, cheers like, you on or something? Or yeah, or God feels joy or that makes God happy. Oh, like like you know? praising God. Right, right, which right. That it do. makes God feel good. Yeah. You know? But so I think we have no problem with that. But I think I think it's sort of our and again, I don't. I think this is a little more culturally driven mm. and even then religiously driven. But I just think we have such a hard time with what we think of as these negative emotions, mm-hmm. sorrow and grief and pain and mm-hmm. anger and mm-hmm. um, all, and jealousy, all those things, mm-hmm. you know? We have a hard time accepting those on ourselves. And so I think part of our our reason for throwing this stuff back to God is to say, you know, God isn't sad, so you shouldn't be there. Like, to be more, the faithful act is to then not be sad. Yeah. You know, and it's like it's somehow that being sad over the loss of someone right. is, is somehow not a, a faithful act. Yeah, and what we know in our human experience is that you can be sad and and joyful simultaneously. Right. Yeah, you, right. You can Feelings live both are far of those more complicated things. than, yes. and so, so I think so much of this just comes from an effort to kind of move on and get people to mm. move on, or to help ourselves kind of make sense of it all, and just, and then just our whole goofy fear of death. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. we just we don't because we don't know mm-hmm. for sure what's going to happen. All yes. we can do is talk about it. it. You know, it scares the bejeepers out of people, and so we have to come up with these narrative structures to help us. M- live in a way that isn't completely fatalistic, you yeah. know? And, and I guess, you it's know... It's like the ma- biggest coping strategy that all of us have. Yeah, and, and I guess, you know, when when my uh, non-God-believing or God-orienting friends, my atheist friends, um, they, they want to just write all this stuff off to, to being, you know, a fantasiful story that sure. people have to tell themselves to live, and they, so they'll respect religion without respecting the details of it. But... And me, as a religious person, wants to have an interreligious dialogue about that. Like, mm-hmm. look, there are more ways to talk about this that aren't quite so fantasiful. Yeah. They're much more grounded in, in our human experience because that's all that we have. And yeah. I think when we dehumanize ourselves in our, in our death narrative, mm-hmm. when we say, really, what I need to be is less human, the process of dehumanizing has really negative consequences to it, <laughs> right, right? Right. Like the one thing you don't want to do is to not pursue what it means to be a, a, a thoughtful, caring human being. Yeah. Like religion right. ought to cause us to be more human. 
right. not and, less. And we should be, you know, as people who treasure life and treasure relationships, and if we think that as people created in the image of God, we're created for relationships mm-hmm. and connection, you know, community mm-hmm. and all those things that I think are mm-hmm. true. Uh, you know, like the idea that then you wouldn't grieve when that's somehow ripped apart. Right, and that God's not grieving alongside, yeah, or as seemed, you put it in the story, grieving first. Grieving first, right. Yeah. God's is the first heart to break. That, you know, I mean... It is it is sort of this dehumanizing thing to say don't grieve or don't grieve as deeply as you are or grieve for a couple of months and then move on. Yeah. You know, our friend Mike Stavlin is writing a, a book about grief, and he mentioned this on mm-hmm. Facebook the other day that somebody said to him, you know, apparently the... The limit of grief is two months. Then you should be. Then yes. you should be ready to move. Yeah, that, that, yeah, yeah. Because he had the, the. That's death like of saying. Children. That's like saying, how long should your joy last over having a child or or uh, meeting someone you love or you know yeah. having something great happen in your life? You should. You, there's a limit of how much joy you should feel over that. Yeah, and, know, and, we wouldn't say that to people. Right. Actually, we maybe we would. <laughs> really, like like you're like, still like, living you know, off. The yeah, right. Really. Pass you by that glory five days. Years right. Ago. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Can you move yeah. on? Yeah. Well, yeah, and 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 obviously everyone's trying to make sense of it, right? Everyone's trying to. So as we said earlier, when people grieve, they're going to grieve however they need to. Yeah. But it also seems that we should try to narrate a story of the human expression of life and death that doesn't minimize our humanity quite as much by giving to God this sort of disregard. What seems to me what people are saying oh, is, yeah. is, a, is, a, is a disregard for your human experience right. where God's really up to something better. So someday you'll don't, see don't, that. So don't be so sad. And, and it seems that yeah. empathy would, I mean, because those of us who have spent time with, with small children, y- youngsters, no, you're going to work through whatever struggle it is, whether you're hungry or you fell down or, you know, whatever right. the pain is. But that shouldn't make you just say to yourself, oh, you'll get over it. You have no idea how bad this pain is going to be. You know, right. pain's going to be much worse later. Skin and in your gonna knee be, is it's, nothing good. Yeah. You should just, yeah. you should just move on. That, that doesn't seem very, very normal. Yeah. And I wonder if our narratives of God needs another angel, God just wanted her to be home, all of that kind of thing, isn't somehow an attempt to, to, to accomplish that. And, um, and, and it's very difficult to talk about this. You know, I even in going into the first segment here, uh, on this conversation, I said, you know, we're going to come back and talk about death, but it's not going to be so bad. Right. Right. <laughs> right. Like there's this right. desire to just like, we do avoid it. And it's the birth and death are almost the only guarantees right. in our human right. experience. It's coming. Yeah. It's coming for us and, all. And maybe yeah. that's what it is. Maybe it's the inevitability of it that makes well, it And it is. It yeah. I mean, it is. It's that tricky balance between just living like we're all going to die and mm-hmm. trying to make this life feel like it matters in some way. Yeah. And so all of those things are kind of structured together to make a, I think, a, a, a confusing narrative for us. Brian, do we have time to talk to Hazel? We got about twenty seconds left. Can we? Okay, Hazel, hold on, and we'll and we'll we'll catch you up here after the break if you can hold on. I know we I know we have a caller on the line, so uh, we'll have have Hazel hold tight if you can, dear, and we'll uh, talk to you after the break on AM nine fifty, and the Progressive Voice of Minnesota and DougPagetRadio.com. dot com.